evening ladies and gentlemen and first of all and most importantly a very happy world art day to you all and um, for those of those those of you that are returning for the second time today um welcome back we hope you enjoyed um the series of talks we had this morning from a variety of different art specialists and art workers and i think um you'll join me in saying that it was a really good morning session um Thank you for coming back and taking part in the evening session with five new organizations and five new countries that we're going to learn about authors from as well. For those of you joining us for the first time today, which I'm assuming all the panelists are given the time zones, uh, a very happy World Art Day to you all. Um, thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge with us and sharing the day with us. So thanks for that. It is great pleasure that we have you here today, um, all the attendees here to learn more about the author work being done in the respective countries and also the panelists and presenters that are sharing their knowledge, time and expertise with us today. So again, um, at the risk of repeating myself, thank you to you all for joining us. As many of you will know, there are two different webinars taking place across the day and this is the second part. The reason we hold two different webinars is to, to ensure that there is no time restrictions placed on anybody. So anybody in certain parts of the world that can't come to the morning one still gets a chance to join us and learn about amazing art work being done around the world. It's also worth noting that both of these um, webinars will be put online. So if you want to rewatch this one or watch for the first time the earlier one, then they will be online probably within the next few days or so. Um, the reason ISF launched World Art Day a few years ago was to help put otters on the map, help uh, increase conservation work and awareness across the world. And through the years, we have managed to make this uh, event grow and grow thanks to people like yourselves, both the speakers and the attendees coming to join us. Thank this year, we have events in over four, no, sorry, not over, exactly 40 countries which is amazing, one more than last year. So we're glad to see it continue to grow. Um, and of course the two webinars, which have registrants from 45 different nations and we had about 200, 250 odd registrations across the two webinars. So it's awesome. Just a bit of housekeeping, just to keep everything moving smoothly. And so everybody knows how they can interact with the attendees. Um, after each talk, there'll be a small period of time to talk to each respective talk uh, presenter and expert. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to throw them into either the question and answers box or the chat boxes at the bottom, and I can ask each one. At the end as well, we should have a little bit of spare time where we can open it out to the floor and any questions you might have kept, you can throw them in there or any questions I had to, to skip over. Earlier in the thing, we can revisit and get all the questions asked so you have all the knowledge you can. Um, so for this afternoon session, we are delighted to be joined um, by five different people or organizations working in different factors in regards to autism, wetland conservation. So I'm just gonna introduce briefly each speaker and then before each talk, I'll give a little bit more detail about how they work and what they work and the species they work on, etc., and where they are from. So um, first of all, we have Fawz Kilani, um, who is going to do a presentation on otters in Tunisia. Um, we have Lali Fasola and Claudio Chekhovar. Um, they're going to present on the challenges for Southern River otters in Northern Patagonia, Argentina. And we have Angela Doroff, who is going to talk about warming oceans, sea otters and clams. And we have Manuel Santiago, who is going to present on the advances in the knowledge of neotropical otter ecology in Costa Rica. And then we have the Tucan Rescue Ranch, who are also based in Costa Rica um, and their Otter Ambassador Project. And they're going to show a video and also a, a brief presentation on wetland conservation through education and action. So just to give a little bit more information about the Tucan Rescue Ranch site, um, they've run an auto ambassador project. So we have Stephanie from Tucan Rescue Ranch currently, um, but it'll actually be two children, two kids that are gonna be presenting what they've been doing. They're obviously still in school today, but have been granted some time to join us, so they'll join us a little bit later 
um, in terms of what they're doing. So it'll be Juliana Morales and Elodie Colbert, and they'll join us in an hour, an hour and a half or so, and we'll meet them at that point. Um, again, thank you. We're delighted to be sharing our day with all of you speakers and all of you attendees. Like I say, if you have any questions during any of the presentations, feel free to chuck it in and we can ask it at the end. And that's kind of all from my side. So without further ado, I'll let you listen to the auto experts and not myself anymore. So I'll pass you over to the first auto expert that we have, um, who is from Tunisia, uh, Fawz Kilani, who is with the Association Tunisienne de la Vie Sauvage. Apologies if I pronounced that wrong in any way. Um, and the presentation on otters in Tunisia. So just to give a, a quick uh, introduction to Faust Kilani. So Faust Kilani obtained her master's degree in evolutionary ecology from the University of Tunis El Menar in Tunis. Her research focused on the behavior of oryx groups in Zoom and Bohedma National Parks. From late 2020 to 2023, she worked as a consultant for a project with the ATVS on mammals in northern Tunisia, including the Eurasian otter. Fowles believes that working on this species in Tunisia can fill the knowledge gaps and raise awareness about it in her country. So again, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Fowles and thank you, Fowles. Thank you, Ben. Thank you again for the invitation. So I'll uh, share my screen. Okay, so... Um, uh, I'm here today to present you um, to talk about the Eurasian otter in uh, Tunisia. But first, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the association that I work in uh, in Tunisia. is uh, the Tunisian Association for Wildlife. Uh, it's a non-governmental uh, association that uh, works towards uh, the study and the conservation of uh, the biodiversity and to raise awareness about, uh, about its uh, importance in Tunisia. So uh, one of our target species is the otter, and um, many people in Tunisia, uh, they still, still don't know that we have otter in Tunisia, and we, uh, maybe because of the lack of scientific work in Tunisia, because if we see um, the last scientific work in Tunisia uh, has been done uh, by uh, McDonald and Mason in 1983, so it's uh, the last work that uh, is published that we know of, and um, it describes the habitat of the uh, otter and its uh, distribution in Tunisia. So in uh, 2020, we uh, went to investigate uh, the otter in uh, uh, northern uh, Tunisia. It's a special place. It's um, classified as uh, a key biodiversity area where uh, there is the biggest, uh, the second biggest dam in, uh, in the country. So we basically did a survey of 300 uh, meter of distance in 19 sites and mainly in the watercourses that are connected to the dam and um, the place between the sea and uh, the dam and uh, places that surrounding uh, the dam. So these are the types of uh, habitat that are prospected, rivers and uh, many type of many uh, habitat of uh, rivers and uh, the dam of Sidi uh, Barak. So um, we, the survey distance and sites were chosen um, because of the ease, uh, the, the it, Access is uh, easier in these uh, places, and uh, because of our uh, logistics, and at that uh, time, so we found some uh, footprints of um, otter, and uh, it was a good moment when we found these uh, footprints. Uh, we maxim we found maximum of uh, uh, footprints of two individuals at the same uh, sites. And uh, we found it uh, uh, with uh, sprints, uh, basically uh, mainly on uh, rocks, but we found it also on uh, fisher uh, nets found, uh, left by fishermen, like this one. 
these uh, footprints and these signs were found in uh, 15 uh, sites of 19 sites prospected. That means uh, 78 uh, positive sites that uh, were uh, that we found uh, other signs in it. And basically in the main courses that are connected to, uh, to the dam and uh, the area that surrounds uh, the dam. And of course, it's uh, with habitats that has uh, dense vegetation uh, with anarium oleander or rubus or uh, pragmatis. We try to um, to capture the otter in its natural habitat. So we managed to film it uh, in its natural habitat. It's not a full otter, but uh, the shape and uh, of its back and uh, of the specimen we we are uh, we are um, sure that is uh, otter that we captured by camera trap in uh, the same area that we work in. So the, uh, unfortunately, uh, like other species in Tunisia, we have uh, threats uh, that uh, the otter can face. Uh, the first one that is uh, the wildlife vehicle uh, collision, the accident uh, with uh, vehicles. We reported, we recorded three cases between 2019 and 2021. Um, so we found at the same area uh, in northern Tunisia three uh, uh, dead uh, otters. Uh, the second threat is uh, fishing nets um, left by fishermen. So uh, we uh, we recorded one case in 2020 where uh, an otter was uh, drowned because uh, they tried to uh, get their food in in. Uh, near uh, the dam and they get stuck in uh, fishing nets. The third uh, threat is uh, the conflict between um, human and between fishermen and uh, otter. And we, rec we reported one uh, case in 2019. There are other um, potential threats um, in Tunisia. Uh, one of them is the water pollution. We um, uh, during our work in northern Tunisia, we noticed that there are many source, uh, many uh, pollution sources that are connected to uh, water courses. And uh, the other threat is uh, the extending of the ag ag agriculture uh, area. So that can affect the uh, the distribution of the otter. And uh, when we say agriculture, we say pesticides. So that can lead to, uh, again, to water pollution. So these uh, two threats are further investigation. The good thing that there are uh, conservation efforts that is, um, has been led by uh, the association. We try, the first thing we try to do is to raise awareness about this species, to get people to know this species in uh, Tunisia uh, and to protect it at least. Uh, so we managed to produce two short documentary about um, about the otter in Tunisia, and there when and it um, it was the first time that we found the dead uh, otter uh, in that zone. Uh, we uh, did uh, two online webinars on otters, and one of them was uh, was with Yosef, and to, uh, we made sure that Tunisian people know uh, more about this uh, species. And currently, we are uh, preparing a short documentary again about uh, this uh, species. Of course, we can't um, go further without uh, scientific work. Um, we are currently working on trying to um, do some uh, conservation projects. Um, we are uh, doing our database uh, where we can find the observation and information about the author. We also uh, worked in a project called the Wild Connection. Um, we did uh, we produced an application, uh, a phone application, so we can uh, report any um, any dead uh, author or life. Um, we did scientific note in the Yosef journal about the first uh, author that we have seen. Uh, unfortunately, it was um, uh, dead. And we are trying to uh, every time to work on the knowledge gap 
one of these knowledge gap to uh, to get more to know more uh, about the species. Um, unfortunately, if we, in Tunis, uh, we still don't know about um, uh, its uh, recent distribution. Um, we need to know uh, if it's uh, the same as it was in 1983. The behavior of the other species, its foraging habitat, what does it in Tunis? Um, the statue of the species, is it really threatened in uh, Tunisia or the population is stable? And of course, the issue um, with um, about the human wildlife conflict, it needs more further um, uh, investigation so we can um, be able to implement uh, some uh, solution with uh, local people. So um, it was uh, this all uh, about uh, the author in uh, in Tunisia, it's uh, a glimpse on what we are uh, currently doing. Um, thank you, Ben, again for the opportunity to uh, talk about it, and we hope we um, you go learn more about it in Tunisia. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Faris, and thanks for your uh, very informative presentation in regards to the otters in Tunisia. Um, if anybody has any questions for Fowles about otters in Tunisia or any of uh, the aspects she presented on today, then feel free to throw them in the questions and answers box. Um, one question I have, I know you were saying about the distribution in regards to the one of your gaps is learning if they're still distributed widely across the country. I know as you go further south in Tunisia, it becomes more desert like so it's the populations do you think more focused on the northern part of Tunisia yes that's um that's what we think because um uh, the main uh, footprints and signs we found we found it in northern uh, west of Tunisia even the observation of dead otters we found it in northern uh, west uh, of uh, Tunisia so we believe that uh, there's a population stable one uh, we hope so, that uh, is located in that uh, area. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think from the pr presentations this morning and then your presentation, um, it's really important, and you talked about it a little bit, about how it's really important to raise awareness. And uh, I know IOSF was involved in your webinar a few years ago, and you've mm -hmm. obviously continued to raise awareness, but it, it's really important to let the public know. And if the public know about your work, then they're more likely to report otters to you as well. So it'll help the otters, but also Definitely. help you get the data that you need. Um, Dennis has asked, uh, are there any legal protections for otters in Tunisia? Yes, it's uh, protected in Tunisia um, by the law, but um, there's no um, the law enforcement. It um, needs more work to work on it. So, but it's uh, it's protected in Tunisia. Does anybody have any further questions? For files, I give them a few seconds. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time to talk about Tunisian and otters. Um, if anybody has any questions for files over the next wee while, then chuck them in the the chat box and we can bring Asker at the end of the webinar and at the end of all the presentations. So thanks, Fowles. Um, Thank you. I'll pass over to our next speaker. So our next speakers are joining us today from Argentina. It's Lali Fasola and Claudio Chacobar. Uh, and they're going to present on the challenges for Southern River otters in Northern Patagonia, Argentina. So just to give you a a quick introduction to them before I pass over for their presentation. Claudio and Lali have long, a long history with this little known otter. Claudio started studying the Hualin in the 80s, gathering information on the distribution in Andean Argentinian Patagonia and its ecological requirements. He also raised the alarm on the retraction of on the Hualin uh, distribution for Argentina. From 2004 on, Lally widened and deepened this work, updating the information on the Hualin distribution and potential threats. In 2016, Lally and Claudio started a new project together with a team combining national parks, regional office biologists, students, and CONICET researchers 
focused on the restoration of Southern River otter populations in Northern Patagonia. The project's ultimate goal is to design a strategy for the recovery of this otter in Northern Argentinian Patagonia based on scientific evidence, which they will share with us today. Thank you to Lali and Claudio for joining us and I'll pass the floor over to you. Thank you. That's perfect, thanks. Yeah, here. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh. Hello, everybody. I am Claudio uh, Chehevar, uh, and I, I will present the first part, and then uh, Lali will go on, will continue. Challenges for the Southern River Rotter in Northern Patagonia, Argentina. The Southern River Rotter, or Lontra Provocax, is maybe the species of otter worldwide with the most restricted distribution. Essentially, it's a Patagonian otter living in Chile and Argentina. Um, well, this is uh, the, the, the team we are working on, and we, are, we, we have contacts with other teams in, in Chile or other people in Argentina. Well, here is Lali and me, and there are two biologists from national parks and uh, two uh, researchers from the National Research Agency. And he is from, uh, also from the research agency and Aves Argentinas or Argentinian Birds, an organization who is supporting this research. Well, there are four species of otters in our country. One is the our species now, Lontra provocax, Southern River Otter. Its common name is Wijin or Wijin, uh, but I will refer to it as the otter. Uh, well, and also marginal and unconfirmed reports of returning of the giant otter. And the most widespread in our country is this, the neotropical otter. And also there are marginal records and unconfirmed at the present of the marine uh, otter. Well, the, our, the otter we are speaking about today uh, lives in Patagonia and the, the main populations in Chile and Argentina are in a narrow fringe in the Andean forest, but it also occupies other habitats su such as the Patagonian steppe. Uh, the Patagonian steppe occupies most of the large Patagonia region. And also in the marine shores or marine coast habitats in the extreme south. This is the uh, in, near the Ushuaia area. Well, the otter uh, almost all of the diet in North Patagonia, which are freshwater populations, because there are also marine populations in the south, almost all of the diet is composed of crustaceans, th this crab, uh, and this crayfish. Also consumes fish, native and invasive fishes, but in uh, smaller quantities. We have this, th there are Water, some watersheds without these crustaceans because of historical biogeographical reasons. And so we are not, uh, we, we, it's a question pending what do they rely on the otter when they are present in these basins. On the marine coast, its diet balances between fish and crustaceans. Uh, the conservation status of the species in Argentina is decla officially declared endangered, also in Chile, and it is in the red in the IUCN red list as endangered and decreasing. Well, some of the 
past threats that uh, that apparently caused uh, in, uh, caused the a decline or uh, impacted the conservation of the species is past hunting. Essentially, there is no perhaps there is occasional hunting now, but no not a serious one. But in the past, for example, this is an example of a very old post. Uh, advising that this this uh, this fur uh, enterprise pays well paga bien some species and the, these are the wigines no they they pay it the the otter fur well and another threat that ecologically is still operating is the introduction of salmonids of a northern hemisphere trout and salmon Lali, go ahead. Okay, so just uh, for you to know what is uh, the story of this daughter in our region is that in, in the past its distribution was was wide even when it's like uh, an author with a really restricted uh, distribution it was wider in the past and so we could reconstruct the, the this distribution uh, because uh, for records in literature or for interviews with old people and so what we can see that there were many watersheds with otters in the past but when we when Claudio started in the back in the 80s to to work with these otters the situation that he found was completely different all that distribution was actually really restricted to uh, a part of a single watershed um, that was uh, and and that this uh, population that he found uh, was completely within a national park and so that was the situation that, that, that Claudio found back in the 80s and when I started working with Claudio in uh, in the early 2000s uh, I, I, I went back uh, and tried to to see what these otters were and actually what I found is that Claud the, 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 the otters were are only in the place where uh, where Claudio found it back in the 80s, like 20 years before that. Another another group um, another another group also was working with uh, with otters and looking for otters in the steppe, and they found like a, an isolated population or a group of otters that were in in one of these rivers of the steppe. The one of the pictures that that Claudio showed you, and oh. so that was the situation in the early in let's Sorry. say in 2005 and um, well after we re retake all this project in 20 20 years after that or almost 20 years after that the situation is more or less the same uh, the the problem is that this population or this group from from the this river in the step apparently has disappeared we con we we already have or we 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 have this main population in this national park, the one that found, that Claudio found in 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 the eighties, and there are some other sightings uh, in other watersheds that are really really recent, but we don't know the situation of these of these places. We don't know whether there are um, individuals that are recovering from Chile, for instance, or whether there are uh, relictual populations there is a situation that we need to tackle. The next one. And so uh, our main question or the research question, the what we where we what we what worries us is why they're not recovering after this threat to stop. Uh, and I am talking about this hunting that uh, actually caused the these populations to uh, to drop. And so we organized our research uh, in four different questions. We, where are they now? Where are the otters now? Um, are there new threats operating on the otters? What is the connectivity like between this group or the areas where the otters could be? And what we can do to make them back? And in terms of uh where are they now is we continue doing this monitoring that uh, claudio started in the 80s and you will see that this is a project 
which is really nice. It's like it has like three three generations of researchers working in the same project. So it's Claudio. What Claudio started doing in the 80s, I repeat it in early in the 2000s, and now we have students working on the same thing with us uh, 20 years later. And so this this question about where the authors are in the present time uh, is something that is really important and also that we need to uh, to the to determine what is the population situation of those well of those groups and the next one and when we started uh, working with others the next one please uh, what we were doing were uh, doing transects looking for signs as everyone has done uh, while working with authors, but now our students are working with new uh, methodologies. So we started uh, with one of them uh, working with environmental DNA. So this is like really new and this is like really nice uh, to us. Um, and we are also training dogs to help us with these, uh, with these searches because in, in places where the authors are recovering probably the detection is so difficult that we need to use like uh, methodologies different methodolog methodologies in a complementary way and the other thing that we um, the next please uh, is um, what is going on with the threats are the ah, another thing that we are uh, researching is in not researching, but we are anal continue analyzing the trends in this main population that was found back in, in, in the 80s. And so we still try to, to study and analyze what happened with these populations and what we are seeing um, for, the last, for the last monitoring is that we, this, this population is like receding in, in some of the areas. And so we are like really worried about this. And the next one. Oh, it's difficult. Okay. Okay. What is the next one? <laughs> um, about it, the threats, the reasons why these these populations are reducing, we we actually don't know. But uh, part of this uh, situation could be because of obstacles, and so some of the things that we are starting to see is that in the in the areas where where, where the uh, the otters should be in the front, just moving to recolonize and reconnect all these areas, we start well. We had a dam with a reservoir where the coast is completely transformed, but at the same time, we have some fish farms in those reservoirs. And um, we, we actually know that there's conflict there, but we don't know what is the importance of what, or, and whether this conflict is, is really impacting on this, these authors that need to recolonize these areas. And another thing that is operating in this main population that, I, that we showed you um, is that uh, it's between two cities that are growing in Patagonia. And you know that with cities, we, we always have dogs. And so this interaction with dogs is, is, is it, it could be like really important because they can spread diseases and they actually can attack uh, wildlife. And so when there are some many other things that are going on around this uh, main population that could be um, responsible of, of, uh, of making it um, decrease. And other things that we are working on is about the connectivity. And as, as I told you, this, this, um, the, the dams that were, uh, that were built in this main river, which is connecting a, a huge area of northern Patagonia, is, is operating as obstacle for, for, for auto recolonization. And so we already know because one of our students studied what is the, the habitat suitability of that area and it's completely transformed. It's nothing to do with the original river and it has nothing to do with the lakes where the otters are. And so this is not a good habitat for otters. And so we need to, to solve what are we going to do with that place just to make it recover as a corridor for otters. And the other things that we are doing is just working with, with genetics because, well, this could tell us about the connection about the old areas for otters. It will tell you the, the story, um, the story that was connecting otters before this, this huge crash, for instance. 
Um, the other things that we are doing about connectivity is that we are retaking some uh, some models. We we will try to model the connectivity between this. Um, the next one, please, Claudio. The connectivity of 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 this main population of otters and other and other otters from Chile, for instance, and other areas. And so. We will need to to know um, to to predict where these otters could uh, could use as a recovery vias or routes, and so we can we can focus on 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 protection on those habitats, and so this this would be something like really important if we want them back at some point. Um, the next one, please. And other things that we will go back to is to radiotelemetry studies that Claudio uh, started in the 80s, because we would like to know how these authors are moving in this front of recolonization. And so this is something that we, we would like to, to use also just to know uh, more about this interaction with these fish farms that are in these reservoirs that are interrupting the, continue, the continuation of, of otters' presence in, in this watershed. Um, what we've been doing all these years is we reunite in, the, in 2016 with CONICET and national parks and Aves Argentinas is with, we started analyzing or making a comprehensive analysis of the situation of otters, the past situation, the present situations, how can we go back to the past situation or just to favor uh, the recovery uh, of the otter, analyzing like area by area I'm suggesting uh, trying to use evidence-based uh, information uh, and, and try to decide what sort of science we would need just to make the right decisions for this conservation planning of water recovery. And some suggestions appeared and some of the things that we are suggesting uh, goes from a uh, from making uh, to reinforce the, the the protection of otters in certain important places like uh, this, um, uh, the limitating some sanctuaries, for instance, uh, control of uh, of these productive um, uh, activities that might be uh, com uh, interrupting uh, otter continuity. Uh, obviously, restoring the habitat just to make the favor the the otters movement, but not also this sort of, of, of actions, but uh, we are also thinking about more active actions because uh, we know that at some places we will need to reinforce some populations. And we even uh, we are even thinking in reintroduction, uh, introducing uh, otters in same areas in some national park where we know that they are really protective and that the, the habitat is optimal uh, still. And so we are still, we are even thinking about about this, this, this sort of actions just to make um, the, the whole region uh, um, to favor the others in the whole region. And um, we not only do research, uh, we, we do also outreach activities actually in 2018, we show in this celebration about the World Otter Day. And so we started uh, doing some activities um, uh, in the first years, we were working close to Nahuelwapi National Park with this, where this main population were. And so the sort of activities that we were doing at, um, uh, in those years uh, were related to, uh, to giving talks in a schools, receiving the, uh, just to um, uh, receiving the, the children to show them um, uh, huge uh, pictures about otter uh, life cycle, um, otter habitat, and talk about otters. We also uh, were working along uh, a urban corridor uh, where we painted a school wall uh, in a in a in a school that is strategically uh, located in this corridor. So. Uh, we we make the these children conscious about the importance of being right there. Uh, we we organize cleanings of this human corridor. We even in the pandemics uh, we we organize a race, a family race along this corridor just to feel um, the because this, this corridor is important because uh, it connects two lakes that are actually within the city. 
So that was like a really, a really nice activity. And in the last year, we joined, uh, we joined uh, an event uh, that was really nice, connecting nature and connecting na nature and sport. So we, 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 we were part of the organization of an aquathlon. Uh, that is like two or three slides after this one. <laughs> Um, uh, an aquathlon and it was really nice because this aquathlon was actually suggesting the people that they should behave like like wishiness because it was combining some swimming and some running along the coast and so it was a great event and it was uh, a great way of of, of of making people conscious about the the, the wishiness because most of the people living in the in in our city, they they actually don't know that we uh, live there, and so it was like a nice opportunity to 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 let them know about the importance of this of this area. And actually, many people of different parts of the country uh, came to participate on the aquathlon, and so we hope that we will continue doing this sort of activities because they, they are really nice. Um, this combination of nature and sports is, uh, is something that we think that is really important. And so I think that that, that is, we are part of, of CONICET, of Aves Argentinas, um, the, with the Programa Patagonia, uh, where we work, and also national parks. And so thank you all for listening to us and for the invitation to participate in this way from the celebration of the World Otter Day. Thank you, Claudio and Lali, and thank you for your fascinating insight into not only the species, but the work you're doing and the conservation and the threats that they face. Uh, Claudio, if you just want to stop sharing your screen uh, when you're ready, and if anybody has any questions for, for either Lali or Claudio, then feel free to throw them in. Um, from my side, um, a question from me and uh, Angela herself is going to talk a little bit about uh, more detail about that side of things, but do you see any difference in terms of climate change or is that having any impacts on either the otters or maybe their prey species? Hmm. Hmm. No. Well, no, no, yeah. no, no, not significantly. No. It, it is not on the, on, on the top of, of our worries in relation yeah. to, the, to, the, to this species. Yeah, I think that the only the only thing that could be is the the energetic demand of the cities in Argentina. That could be because that is um, this this river that was interrupted by dams that is actually connecting like half of the half of the the the, the, the half of the area to the north with otters. Uh, I think that energetic demand can can impact in that way. It's, it's, it, it will really complicate the the our work in the in this connection connection vias along these this, these rivers. And there's always the potential threat of having other 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 rivers interrupt by new dams. Uh, that is something because we are growing, cities are growing, and energetic demand is it's always growing. So if uh, we continue on this uh, energy-based uh, methodologies, uh, then yeah, that, that could be one way of, of, of this, but climate change uh, itself, uh, I don't know. I see one question, uh, Ben, from Victoria Montiel about the North American mink. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what I would, I can I answer to Victoria? Okay, then, so well, I I answer. Um, what I can say is that uh, that was some of our worries. Uh, actually, part of my PhD project was based on this 
potential interaction between mink and uh, and otters, but we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't find uh, evidences to say that. What we don't know is what could what could happen in uh, when otters start recovering in some places where mink are really established and what we don't know is about the potentiality well we have some clues um about mink spreading diseases on on, on wildlife and so that could be a, a potential uh, a potential threat uh, uh, through the the presence of the of the American mink, but no direct interaction as we used to think. Ben, are you there? Yeah. Well, well, I will. Well, there is another question. Uh, if we had the chance to do an necropsy in a regime, if we found any particularities, uh, I, no, no, no particularities have, have been found uh, in any necropsy that we know of. And, what and, it, and it's not the, frequent to find uh, no. casualties or not. As uh, I am. I think that the, there are one or two cases in northern Patagonia, probably a couple more in in Tierra del Fuego, in the real in the south, but no more than that. Um, and what role do the Wiginis play in the ecosystem? Well, they are as any otter; they are top predators in the in the water system. Uh, I don't know, Lali, if you want to, and how can they be rehabilitated? Well, it's a, uh, 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 there is a problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, no, in terms of, yeah, uh, we need to, to know that there's sufficient prey uh, to support the population of otters. We need to provide them with good uh, habitat quality. And we think that in many areas uh, where we work in, the conditions are, are given, so that is fine for the otters. Uh, and actually, we need to prepare people to for this recovery of otters. Uh, it's like uh, there's more people in Patagonia now, and so this consciousness about uh, coexisting with this sort of species need to be in the in 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 the people. And so that is another thing that could help this uh, rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Well, and so should we wait for Ben to come back? Yeah. yeah, there is a technical problem, it seems. Uh, this is Angela. I have a question while we're waiting for Ben. Um, I was interested if you are looking at water quality and monitoring of fresh water, including uh, different phytoplankton and, um, and nutrient loading uh, in the areas that you're working with the otters. No, no, not really. Not really. We don't see. It's like where otters are actually in this. There are a few, a few cities there. Uh, there might be some impact in the nearby of these urban areas, but no, yeah, more than no, no more than that. We are so far. We are not really worried about high water quality. Actually, it's. I think that for for most of the distribution of water or the past distribution of waters, water water is fine. Um, but no, something uh, yeah should be yeah it could be it could be good to to start the study. That's well, while these cities 
uh, continue growing probably this this is uh, something that will appear at, at some point uh, a worry that will appear at some point hi all yeah recording in progress can you hear me again yeah with yeah. with the, with, the, with delay from outer uh, space yeah just okay sorry about that guys i don't know what happened uh thank you for for holding the yeah. fort i disappeared for five minutes um did you get all your questions in yeah i think yeah. so okay brilliant thank you so much guys uh sorry about disappearing but i really appreciate you taking the time to come and present to us today and i'm sure all the attendees appreciated your presentations thank you so much thank you too Thank you, everybody. Um, without further ado, I'll pass over to our next presenter, who is Angela Doroff, who is going to be presenting on warming oceans, sea otters and clams. Uh, Angela Doroff has had the fortune of working with sea otters for many years throughout their range, but mainly in her home state of Alaska. Angela's love of research was the root of her career and the application of research to management and conservation actions were imperative. During 1994 to 2020, Angela served as the Sea Otter Species Coordinator for the IUCN Otter Specialist Group and provided red list criteria for sea otters and regular updates on species conservation concerns. So I will pass you over to Angela and thanks, Angela. Thank you. Let me get set up here for a moment. Brilliant. Thank you. And, uh... All right. Well, thank you so much for joining this talk this evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to take us on a short journey illustrating some climate change processes through the lens of sea otters and clams. So back when I started, um, the, 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 the current concern about climate change for sea otters was pretty low to moderate, and primarily because they are limited in the north by shore fast sea ice. With the melting of that shore fast sea ice, there's more habitat to the north. Um, relative sea level rise could also provide more habitat and sea otters are pretty good prey generalists. So this concern wasn't really big. Um, now we actually have quite a bit more information about temp ocean temperature mediated regime shifts in the ecosystem, and there are multiple pathways for climate change to impact sea otters, including ocean chemistry and the increased range and duration of harmful algal blooms. Now, this is really problematic, um, linking these complex environmental drivers that interact with each other uh, to then uh, talk about what that means in a population dynamics um, framework. It's difficult for any species, including sea otters. And I think this complexity for sea otters anyway has, has uh, really presented a barrier to some degree to including some of the climate change um, thinking or broader thinking into management strategies. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about oceanography. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation is a robust recurring pattern of ocean atmosphere climate variability centered over the mid-latitude Pacific Basin. And I'm really thankful to Wikipedia for this definition because this process is anything but simple. Um, you might be more familiar with the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. These two processes actually interact to some degree, but the important point here is that the PDO and ENSO are really important for many, many reasons. And what I'm going to focus on is the warm and cool water uh, sea surface temperature changes. And to do that, uh, oh, well, hang on a minute. Many studies have used the PDO to understand physical and uh, biological processes. And the figure I've cribbed from the publication cited below is one such study. And this happens to just be a really nice graphic showing the negative phases, the positive phases, um, corresponding to warm water events and cooler water events. Now, there are two things I'd like you to notice about this graph. One is that the duration of these warm and cool water periods are, aren't even. And then the second thing is 
they're also not, you know, sometimes the, the, the change is really sharp and sometimes it's a little more ragged. And I would really like to focus us on where I have this big circle of the late 1970s, where there's a, a, a cool trend and then a sharp warm trend that, that has had some staying power. We'll talk a little bit about the late 1990s shift later. So let's look at what happened here. So researchers used decades of commercial fishing, uh, fisheries harvest data and looked at the PDO relative to species composition over time. And what they found is a cold water favors shellfish uh, systems and warmer water favors ground fish. So there was this clear signal of ecosystem response to sea, uh, sea surface temperature. Now, What's that got to do with otters? Well, to, I'll have to take you on a sea otter side trip here. And to do that properly, I need to talk a little bit about sea otter history. So bear with me. I'm going to walk through a few things here. This is a map from Carl Kenyon showing the original distribution of sea otters. And here he, I just put these little paintball splotches for to highlight the remnant colonies. So by 1911, there were 13 remnant colonies. Uh, post fur trade. The two uh, yellow ones have died out. So uh, 11 total have repopulated uh, the global population. And it started from about maybe 2000 animals scattered across all of these small um, populations. And it's a pretty uh, well-documented, lots of history here, but I wanna just drill into it a little bit and this area that I just put the circle on between the Prince William Sound and the Northern Kodiak Archipelago remnant populations is Lower Cook Inlet. And a little, uh, some important features about this area is it has the fourth largest tides in the world. It um, has four volcanoes, so very mountainous on the Alaska Peninsula side. So what that means is this water is really, um, uh, challenging. It's a challenging maritime environment. The next thing I have badly drawn is the Alaska Coastal Current here, and it's a um, strongly seasonal feature. It, it breaks up a little bit in the winter with mixing, but it's one of the key monitoring um, places uh, we have in the Gulf of Alaska for monitoring uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, uh, water stratification, freshwater forcing, um, and changes in dynamics for the Gulf of Alaska. So it's a pretty important feature. And a little uh, foreshadowing, I wanna draw your attention to these two stars in the middle of the circle are the villages, uh, they bound the villages of Port Graham and Soldovia. And then this star, if I can find my cursor again, is the Aleutic Pride shellfish hatchery. So we'll talk about those in a little bit too. So history. Sea otters were completely harvested out of that air, the area in the circle I showed you by 1792. An estimated uh, 11,400 pelts were recorded in less than a six year period. So this, uh, this harvest, now I just described how, how gnarly that marine environment is. This, these are sailing ships, badarkies, kayaks, and with a really factory-like efficiency, they um, moved, removed otters from this region. Um, and so it was about 200 years before sea otters recovered to some population level uh, that, that was um, uh, back to being a keystone species in the system. So that's a long time for a, a, their habitat to have been without this predator. Fast forward to the 1970s, and nearly every remnant and translocated population center was growing numerically and expanding in geographic range at this time. This was just a hot time for sea otter recolonization. Now, we crawl, recall that we talked about the PDO shifting from a cooler to a warmer. This was detrimental to shellfish, shrimp, crabs, forage fish, and it favored ground fish, the halibut and cod over shellfish. Ground fish are also a phenomenal predator and they consume shellfish. So you can start to see this is not being a good time for shellfish. 
Further, um, we developed some really um, highly profitable shellfish in the absence of sea otters in these regions. And this was a period that was um, really uh, lots of heightened conflicts between shell fisheries and sea otter recolonization. And these conflicts still dominate most of our management strategies today. So you might well ask, well, hasn't the PDO shifted back to the cool water and isn't this giving shell fisheries some break, uh, you know, shifting back to cooler waters? And the answer is that's really unclear. Um, and what you can see from this figure is that that periodicity of cold to warm to cold is really tight and it's um, uh, just unclear. The system is still dominated by uh, ground fisheries. And there were two things that were really interesting that happened during this time. Um, during a three year period peaking in 2015, there was an unexplained warm water anomaly that persisted in the Gulf. This was a warm water mass that, that rose up and just stayed next to the coast for a long time. And it triggered harmful algal blooms. It um, increased the water stratification, decreased nutrient availability in the system. And it caused some starvation events for up in the upper trophic levels for seabirds and whales. Um, it was pretty phenomenal. That was a really interesting thing. Um, and it really did some foreshadowing about warmer water systems. Uh, more recently in 2022, the Pacific Northwest had an unprecedented heat dome. This is a very different climactic process than the warm water anomaly, but nonetheless, this hot, air mass sat over this region and for regions with law, large tidal exchanges where you have the mudflats exposed for long periods of time, that heat dome caused pretty significant mortality to shallow bur burrowing and surface bivalves. So let's talk about bivalves for a minute. Um, it's a, they're a food resource for many, many species. In some regions in Alaska, bivalves make up to 70% of the sea otter diet. Bivalves have this really complex life history. Um, they have temperature mediated spawning. Um, different species are different, sen are sensitive in different ways to salinity, temperature, ocean chemistry, that's your pH and aragonite saturation, and bioturbation of sediments. Most clam species and bivalve species don't do well with high, high activity in the sediment structure, and that's your storm events and your flooding events. So you can see from this list that climate change has a fingerprint that touches most of the life history stages for uh, bivalves. And in the vicinity of the villages of Port Graham and Soldovia, most of the clams are gone from their harvest areas. Now, these villages are very aware of sea otter and uh, impacts to their prey. They've studied it, um, but they sat back and asked a very different question. And their question was, where is the clam, clam life history cycle breaking down? And once we understand that, what can we do? And I think that's a really important question. So to recap a little, we talked about ocean ecosystem regime shifts uh, that are temperature mediated. We talked some about toxin producing phytoplankton. Harmful algal blooms can be either acute or chronic impacts for sea otters. There's been a documented complex relationship between cardiomyopathy and demoic acid exposure for sea otters. Um, demoic acid is an amnesic shellfish poisoning. Um, on other upper trophic levels like sea lions, there's been lots of documentation of a degradation of the hippocampus in the brain where animals were dying and, you know, the kind of agonal piece to that was seizure. Butter clams sequester saxitoxin and saxitoxin is um, paralytic shellfish poisoning. It interrupts the sodium channels and paralyzes breathing. Um, they, these clams can um, sequester <laughs> saxitoxins for, you know, one to two years, and it's a favored prey of sea otters. So this may be, in future conditions, uh, decreasing prey availability for sea otters. There's been quite a bit of work recently uh, looking at the occurrence of demoic acid and saxitoxins in the food chain, 
in the marine system. And it's basically, there's prevalence throughout the entire, uh, from lower trophic levels all the way to top, top trophic levels. Let's talk for a moment about ocean acidification. Um, toxins increase in toxicity through biochemical changes associated with lower pH. What that means is as oceans become more acidic, the saxitoxin level may be the same, but the, the toxicity will increase. This is some really uh, wonderful work done through the University of Hull in the UK. Check it out if you get some time. And also, uh, we're probably a little more aware of the negative impacts of ocean acidification to calcium carbonate shell forming species. And that's in the early stages of shell forming, um, uh, just a breakdown of that cycle of getting enough shell or spending more energy on building shells. And this this will in, this this difficulty will increase with ocean acidification and and the current decrease in aragonite saturation levels for shell building creatures. So putting that in a, a global context, then I just am advocating for more cross-disciplinary science applied to single species management, bringing in some of this framework to our thinking as we move forward. Am I saying don't monitor for population dynamics, life history, and all that? Absolutely not. That is critical. That's the base to understanding anything else. Um, it's really important. Um, and you, you probably can see from this talk that nothing is going to get much easier for shellfish adapted to cold waters in the North Pacific system. These are really nutrient rich waters. There's been a long history of that ad adaptation. It's going to be hard for those species going forward. And it's my hope that for sea otters, we can spend a little bit less energy on the sea otter commercial fisheries conflicts and a little bit more energy on understanding the emerging warm water ecosystem. Thanks so much for listening today. And I will leave you with this quote from Mother Teresa. Thanks, Angela. That was a really interesting and insightful oh, insight into, yeah. into yeah. how climate change is affecting CRs. Obviously, it might be more directly affecting the, the shellfish, but that's obviously having it then, then having a direct impact on the species as well. And as you mentioned, with the Alaskan settlements up in that kind of part of the world, they've got a high reliance on shellfish themselves. So with the shellfish going down, you're going to see more conflict with the otters because obviously otters eat shellfish. People want to eat shellfish and make make some money off the shellfish. So, like you say, if we can't find a solution, then I don't know what the kind of what the future holds for the the long term survival of both. I guess it's not just the otters that are affected. So, if anybody has any questions or comments or anything, feel free to throw them into either the the questions and answers box uh, or the chat box. Um, I was going to say, are you seeing obviously with the the major effects, and you did you talk brushed on it as well. Like, is that conflict between communities and between the CRs is that becoming worse? Lack of a better word, is it worsening quickly because of it? Um. Yeah, I think it's different in different places. You know, I, I gave the example of the villages out on the Kenai Peninsula and um, they started that place of like sea otters are, you know, like they're, they're eating too much, they're taking our food. When they actually looked at it, they weren't seeing that, that it was the impact yeah. they thought it was. And what they were really seeing is just this whole scale um, the clams aren't there. They don't have the, the spawning densities they need. And they were wanting to look at that system better and understand whether you could, you know, um, spawn in a hatchery and outplant, would that help the system? So they began asking much more uh, detailed questions. I think in many places, we're still just trying to hang on to the shell fisheries. Um, and we want them to be as profitable as they were in the 70s. And I just think that's not coming back. Yeah, absolutely. I guess part yeah, I of the we talked about maybe six months ago, we talked about the snow crab and 
Mm -hmm. snow crab is that right it just they all disappeared and i know you mentioned that they weren't necessarily a direct prey of otters but it's obviously it has a knock-on effect to the whole ecosystem and Mm -hmm. it's very concerning we have a lot of questions coming in now so uh, so ho yin asked uh, i would like to ask does the climate change and change of water temperature affect sea otters migrate migratory or movement pattern Not, not so much. Um, you know what? They they are capable of great movement, up to forty five kilometers a day. But generally, they don't do that. And a lot of it has to do with their high caloric needs. They eat like twenty five percent of their body weight a day, and they need to know where they can find food. That's an important feature for how they de- develop their home ranges. And they move when they need to. And that's what, how they were able to recolonize from those small remnant populations and translocated populations. But we aren't really seeing like Southern sea otters are having different kinds of challenges. They're more exposed to um, harmful algal blooms with increased runoff. They're more uh, exposed to different kinds of pathogens, land-based pathogens in the marine system. And um, in one area in Morro Bay, they were starting to get this weird algae on their fur because because the waters were warmer. So there are different kinds of challenges. Uh, sea otters aren't trying to move away from those challenges. They're dealing with them probably as best as a critter can. Yeah. Uh, Dennis asked, uh, do you know if these negative effects on bivalve populations is also apparent in the North Atlantic? I don't know much about the North Atlantic, so I'm, I probably can't answer that properly. <laughs> yeah that's fair it's probably one for us given we're based in north atlantic but i also don't know much information about that from our side um mm-hmm. renata chiarella has asked uh, couldn't sea otters feed on the fish that benefits from warmer waters or since those fishes are also impacted by the decrease of shellfish would uh, mm-hmm. that would be a very unbalanced ecosystem it's, it'll be a different ecosystem for sure. And yes, they do eat. Um, I watched them eat flounder uh, and uh, um, um, little lump stuckers. I, I, I'm spacing on the Latin of them right now. Yeah. Um, but they do eat fish and sand lands. Um, they'll eat, and sand lands are tricky because they really bioaccumulate um, toxins. You know, uh, they're, I, I'm not entirely sure how the, why they um, pack uh, harmful algal bloom toxins more in their system than maybe some other things, but sea otters will eat sand lands as well. So that they, you know, they have a range of, I want to say something like 250 different species they will eat and sea otters are adaptable. They, they will figure something out um, and it will be different, um, but it, I think, what, actually, this might help. You know, one of the things with the commercial fisheries, you need a really strong biomass to make that that highly profitable extraction of shellfish for this fishery. And I think the reason sea otters and those fisheries are less compatible is sea otters knock that prey base way down. They don't make it extinct. They don't, you know, the, the, yeah. the species aren't lost that they eat. They just aren't available in these much larger quali- quantities that make them desirable as a commercial fishery. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Claudio um, Chehobar, obviously one of our panelists, has uh, said, Angela, these kind of acidification impacts, do they also affect crustaceans? You know, I that's a great question. As I was listening to your presentation, my head was really spinning about, you know, freshwater uh, shifts in either pH or um, harmful algal, different kinds of harmful algal blooms and um, warmer freshwaters too. And I, there's so much I don't know the answer to on that, but I'm very curious about. Yeah, that's fair. And Graham Roberts has asked, can the shellfish and clams be commercially farmed in a secure facility um, away from predation? There is a lot of talk about that right now in Alaska. It's like, well, what do you do? And it might be that that we use hatcheries differently than we have, not for the mass production per, per se, but just uh, to um, 
buffer uh, shell fisheries um, had an had a big impact. Gosh, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, where um, oh, <laughs> deep water, rich, nutrient rich deep water, but very corrosive water came into different shell fisheries and it killed all their spats. Um, it, and it happened all the way up the coast. And that really made these hatchery operations think about their water source, how to buffer that, how to, um, how to work with that new dynamic because it never happened before. Um, and I think that that is the area of exploration. And I think hatcheries do have a role in, um, we just don't know what it is and how to do it environmentally soundly, I think is a huge piece to that. Um, but yes, they, I mean, I think, I think there's so much up in the air and we just, we have to experiment, keep our minds open and try some things. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, if anybody has any further questions for Angela, um, I will leave it open for a few more seconds. Um, but in the meantime, I'll say thank you very much. Thanks You're for welcome. your insightful presentation. And like I said, for the for the previous speakers as well, if anybody has further questions for them, then just chuck them up in the chat box or the question answer box and I can answer or ask them, sorry, at the end when we kind of open the floor to everybody. So with no more questions, I will pass over to our fourth um, presenter today, who is Manuel Santiago of the University of Idaho and his presentation on the advances in the knowledge of neotropical otter ecology in Costa Rica. So just to give uh, a brief introduction into Manuel himself before I pass over. So Manuel started studying otters at zoos, identifying stereotypical behaviors associated with captivity. In 2006, he completed his bachelor's degree studying ecological aspects of otters in southern Mexico. He also conducted occupancy and distribution models as well as habitat associations for the species in northern Costa Rica as part of his MS degree in 2011 and 2012. In 2014, Manuel updated the potential distribution map of neotropical otters in Belize. In 2018, Manuel led a project in Pantanos de Centla Biosphere Reserve south, uh, in southern Mexico. The main goal of the project was to identify potential threats to neotropical otters and design an action plan for the conservation of the species in the region. Since 2012, he is a member of the IUCN uh, Otter Specialist Group representative for Costa Rica and coordinator for the species in Central America. Manuel has conducted auto workshops for park rangers, locals and volunteers for community monitoring. Additionally, he has carried out educational activities with the young students in Mexico and Costa Rica. Manuel is currently uh, studying his PhD at the University of Idaho, as mentioned, and is focused on evaluating the demography genetic diversity and genetic structure of neotropical otters in northern Costa Rica using fecal DNA sampling. I will now hand over to Manuel for his presentation. Thanks, Manuel. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, I hope you can see me. I can see you. Yeah. <laughs> Hear me too? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to try to share my, my screen. Perfect. Um, let me see. Yeah, I can see that, Manuel. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Well, um, thanks, Ben, for this uh, nice introduction and also for this uh, invitation. I'm very happy to to have this opportunity to to talk about uh, river others in Costa Rica. Um, okay, let's start. Um, first, I would like to to start with some background information about the species. And as you can see here in this slide, the first description of one individual of river other in Costa Rica was made in almost well, now 100 years ago, and it was made by Cabrera. Uh, Cabrera thought that he found a different or a new other from Central America. So he, he, he named this uh, individual as Londra Mesopit. 
mesopids. So over the year, we, we know that we have only one species in, in Costa Rica, in Central America in general, which is Lontalon chicawis. But this is uh, nice to know that the first attempt to describe the Lontalon chicawis was um, named first like uh, Lontra mesopids. And also, uh, before to moving forward, I would like to say that, highlight that this species is protected for the wildlife conservation law in Costa Rica. And the law consider this species as with small population. So uh, they, they, they are aware about the population of this species. However, we are um, having some troubles by the increase of um, uh, citrix, uh, plantation or also pineapple plantation in, in the north. Also, we, we, we have some trouble with hunting or some fishermen that use pets as, as use river others as, as pets. I met um, one guy in Long China who, 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 who had a, a tropical other just in his house. Um, and this guy trained the neotropical order of this animal to fish with, with him. I mean, after two or three weeks that I visited this, this, this person, he, he called me and he told me that the, the animal just passed away. And I would like to also introduce some information regarding the, the, the envio. The Envio, it's a great institution. It was the first uh, no-profit institution in Costa Rica to study by university in the country. They, they had or they have <clears throat> different areas of activity such as conservation, education, um, they monitor and classify plants and animals throughout the country. And one important thing is that they, they made the first map of, uh, with records of others across the country. So at the beginning, maybe it was in, two, it was 19, 1999, 20 years ago, 24 years ago, they had 22 records. So they put these records on the map. So that was the first map. Uh, this is really, that was a really um, great um, map. But then over the year, we, we, we got more information. I don't know if the InBio is still working. I know that we have the InBio Park, which is open to the public, but I don't know if the InBio is working or conducting the research activities like in the past. <clears throat> but we have uh, access to GBIF or different thesis, article, technical reports, or different data. So I, I went to the, to the web and also talking with some contacts and I made this map. So because I classify some the information or some of the records, uh, different periods. So we have the first record was in 1867, which is a record from a museum. <laughs> then we can see how over the time we can get more and more information. For example, from 2010 to 2019, we have 108 records, which is in these uh, dark circles here over the country. So you are seeing in, in this map, the distribution of the, all these records. And using all the information I summarized uh, related to all the studies in the country, so within a period of three years, I found 17 documents between thesis, article, technical reports, and some data that people share with me. And one important characteristic of this document is that they address uh, unique topics such as I don't know, distribution, or also sometimes they, they address like uh, two or three topics for research. So sometimes we have one document where the author, they work on diet, habitat selection, and relative abundance, and then put all this in one document. 
there are several um, topics, but the most common topics in all these documents are distribution, diet, habitat selection, abundance, um, marking sites. But the most common um, research in the country is uh, diet. It's uh, it's the most common uh, in the in the country. And I would like to to show you this graph, which also I made a summary of all these diet documents. So here you can see that fish and crustacean are the, the most common items in other diet in Costa Rica. However, the consumption mm, can vary across the region, across the year too. <clears throat> For example, we have Spinola, which Manuel Spinola and Carla Rojas, <clears throat> they work it in, on Sarapiki River, and there is a difference of 10 years. So you can see a slightly um, decrease on fish consumption compared between Carla Rojas and Manuel Espinola. But also we have three important documents from Petinas Blancas River, which was made in 2007, 2010, and 2017. And also they analyzed the diet in the same area, the same river. So you can see an increase here from Madrigal in 2007 to uh, Jonathan Navarro in 2017. So they, the consumption of fish um, increased in or river others in, this, um, in these sites. Then also we have uh, another sites, for example, Tortuero National Park with uh, Fran Bonshi, and they also describe that fish, the most common item, and the other side of the country, in the Pacific side, we have uh, smolders, and they also register um, in the Balsa River uh, the fish, like uh, the most common items. There's something particular also in Osa Peninsula, where Smith and Aranta Coelho they they analyze the diet also for the the river others here, but <clears throat> even they use different metrics. In the case of Aranta Coelho, they use he used a different metrics to measure the, the diet. We, we can see that uh, crustacean is the most common item in, for river others in Osa Peninsula. And I would like also to share this map with all the document theses, papers, and technical report, where you can see the distribution of these um, studies for uh, natural plant others in Costa Rica. Uh, you can see that there are three specific groups uh, working in Tortuguero National Park, uh, Peñas Blanca River and Onza Peninsula. They work in different, uh, different topics, but they, they have like a specific site that they, they are working with. <clears throat> and also you can see here, um, this uh, San Juan River Basin, if you see the, the yellow uh, circles, it's uh, where I conduct my, my, my thesis my master thesis, so that was my, my all my area of study. So I worked all over there, and I visit so so many rivers. So you can see the the, the, the big area there. And also, uh, I would like to make a special mention for McDonald and Mason that they 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 traveled through the Pacific side of the country and they found uh, different or uh, so many signs such as scats or footprints across the Punta Arena, Guanacaste area. As I said before, and related to habitat selection by the species, and this is part of my one chapter of my thesis, <clears throat> I surveyed 23 sub-basins, which are all the component of the big basin, like uh, San Juan River Basin. So I found uh, density of trees and number of logs um, are related to other occupancy. So this was at, at a local level, but also I made some buffer. <clears throat> and I found that other are using, oh, other are avoiding or urban 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 site. So uh, it was um, 
it was a really um, relation between um, more uh, forests and more other. And then when you contrast with more, more urban use, you can see how the presence of other just reduce. Also, I made some classification with the strings. And I found that other are using both low and high hierarchy of strings. <clears throat> the same thesis, another chapter, uh, I conduct 42 interviews with locals to identify any type of risk to the species in the rivers. So then I use a canonical correspondence analysis to classify the answer. And I found um, some um, particular um, answer of, because we, we, we found, or I found that human activities are related to, with rivers, with, with, with high hierarchy of rivers. So we can see some removing material for river bank. We can see some construction of dams in these big, uh, biggest rivers. But also in the smallest rivers, we have um, some threats for, for river others, such as um, sewage drain on rivers or dairy farms or hunting with, uh, of conflict with fishermen. So that was part of the thesis. Then uh, again, talking about habitat selection, I have this job from Jonathan Navarro, as I say, he works in Peñas Blancas uh, River. And he found that river width and forest coverage as the most, um, are the most important factor for river other presence in Peñas Blancas River. Then using the same methodology, occupancy modeling, such as Jonathan, I was like my thesis from Master um, Smith and, and collaborators in 2020, he found in Osa Peninsula that river depth and proportion of pasture were associated with the number of river other signs. So you can see it through that even in different, in different parts of the country, the association but the variables of which and other are different according to the rivers and, the, and also the, the side of the country. Um, currently, as Ben said before, as a part of my doctoral research, I'm using fecal DNA to get information on demographic and ecological parameters of the species. These are some pictures from the last season, which was last, last year. So I surveyed the Sarapiqui River, Puerto Viejo River, San Carlos River, and also Tortuguero National Park. I'm working in the same, same areas and um, previous um, studies with uh, Canyon Palma Station, which is one of the most um, important collaborators in, in my thesis. So it was, uh, it was great. I got around 350 samples. Um, from this uh, particular season of uh, this uh, first chapter of my thesis, I'm just conducting an experiment. I'm just uh, com com comparing um, fresh feces and jellies that were collected with deeds and swap. Um, <clears throat> so far, swap. Um, so far, swap protocol amplify the DNA better than this. Uh, we, we noticed that jellies had a higher amplification rate, but we know that jellies uh, are really hard to, to find on the field. But we, we also see that fresh feces amplify better when using the swab storage. So right now I'm just <clears throat> doing a different analysis, just comparing using the same methodology, this and swap, uh, comparing tropical, versus Neartica, so we have some samples from, from South Dakota, so we are compared with this sample from Costa Rica. As I said before, um, these 50 samples are less than 15% of all my collected samples. So I'm still developing a uh, no tropical other multiplex and optimization. This multiplex specific for tropical others, and also I'm just um, 
um, testing different sex ID. In summary, well, we need to take advantage of the technology to increase the knowledge of the species in Costa Rica. It's, it's important to, to generate base information such as diet and relative abundance in every place that we, we know that the other is, is, is the other presence. But also we have um, some information gaps for the species such as the, the what are the, the problem or the impacts causing, caused by use of pe uh, pesticides or hunting or disease or the water quality. We have a lot of for job to do. Uh, also, it's important to include the species in, in the educational plants as a flag species for conservation of rivers. The, the tropical river other is considered as a common species in Costa Rica. So people know that there are others in, on the river, but they, most of them, they don't care about, about them. So it's important to, to teach people about the importance of these species on the ecosystem. And finally, uh, so far, uh, there are some information on genetic diversity and genetic structure for the species in Mexico. I, I think we have like four studies for, yeah, four studies in Mexico and a couple of them in South America. But there is a, a, a gap in Central America, not only, in, uh, not only in, Central, in Costa Rica, but also in Central America. So I hope to, to, to get uh, uh, information about genetic structure and genetic diversity for these species in Central America. Also, I have some samples from Belize, so I hope to get good information. And I know that a good friend of mine from Costa Rica, his name is uh, Adonai. Adonai, he's working on Peñas Blancas River also, and he, he's conducting some genetics analysis. I hope she, she can get good information too. Okay, and um, before to, to end the presentation, I would like to share some activities from the last year that I was, I was there in Costa Rica. So I work with a young student from La Turinbina School. I work with the Emanuel and Mariela from La Turinbina Biological Reserve. And uh, they lead a wonderful environmental education program there. So uh, it, was, it was great spend the time with, with all these kids and with all these new students I, I know because I, I've been talking with, with them that right now they are um, conducting some activities to celebrate the World Other Day in, in the Tinubina School. And with that, and I think almost done, I want to say thank you and happy World Other Day for all of you. Thanks, Manuel. Thank you for your presentation and thanks for highlighting everything basically to do with otters in Costa Rica and getting your work and all the different building blocks exactly what you're doing and trying what you're trying to find out not only in Costa Rica but also across Central America uh, you've obviously done work in in Mexico um, given you're from Mexico I believe uh, and also in Belize so you've done a lot of work and it's really interesting to see how everything is kind of linked and following on from the talk from Claudio and um, Lally earlier, even uh, and uh, Angela in terms of American otters, but also how it's linked to the exact same building blocks or the same from the Tunisian side of all the maybe the pressures that are being put on the species, although it might be different prey and different aspects, it's all kind of the same, same things that are maybe being put on them and your work is highlighting that. So any questions? So, so one question. So, uh, what is the conservation status of Costa Rica, uh, otters in Costa Rica? Uh, the species is protected by the wildlife conservation law. So they they have a specific um, um, treatment for these species. So they consider the species with uh, uh, with a small population. For that reason, is it is protected. Yeah, and do you find um, you talked about how you've done work with children, but also other sort of community work? Do you find that they're well received? You said that they people know they're there, but 
do they like them? Do they? There's obviously be conflict with perhaps with fishermen and fishing communities, but do they are they well received and is the perceptions of them quite high or low or somewhere in the middle? Yeah, it, it, it depends who who are you asking. For example, you ask to people who just have uh, different activities. Yeah, they they will say that they they love river others. Also, when you ask to children who live close to the river, they 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 know about river others. They 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 can show you the scat. They can show you the all the places where they found these uh, signs. But when you talk with with fishermen and they they have some um they try to avoid the species yeah yeah um, yeah that makes sense and yeah um when i was doing my my, my field work for my master thesis i found um a fisherman that he told me that he, he had some trouble with that river when well, river others who just move from the river to the with the, this place they the he has this um the fish and he he was considering to to kill the other because he he uh, he told me I'm losing money because this species because this animal yeah. so I recommend to try to better to put some fences instead to kill the other and and cover also the the the, the side where he put the, the fish yeah I think it's, yeah that sort of thing working with communities is really really important again they're the people and the, the communities, again, that, that live alongside the river otters. So if you can help them be happy with them being around, then that's probably half the battle as well. Um, is there any further questions for Manuel before I introduce our final speaker and final presentations? I'll give them a few seconds. Again, like, like the other speakers, if you have questions um, that you think of in the next sort of we while and you want to chuck them into the chat or question and answer box and we can ask them at the end. Thank you so much, Manuel, again, for sharing your information with us today. Thank you. And that leaves, leads us on to our final presentation, which is going to be in two parts. I am delighted to say that Juliana Morales and Elodie Colbert have joined us and um, they've been granted some time from school. So they are here with us. So what, how it's going to work is we're going to show a video of, of what they've done. And um, there they are. Hi, Juliana. Hi, Elodie. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Thank you for having us. Yeah. My pleasure. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to show your video, which is about eight minutes long in terms of what you've been doing, give you an introduction, and then you've got a, a small presentation for us at the end, don't you? Uh, sorry, Ben, it's backwards. First, they're going to present and then they're going to go and then you can present the video. OK, they'll present first. OK, perfect. Yeah. So I'll just introduce um, the, the project quickly and then I'll let you guys present. So so to celebrate World Daughter Day, the Tucan Rescue Ranch, which is uh, an organization based in Costa Rica that Stephanie works for, and it's um, all about education, rescuing animals and helping animals. Um, and Costa Rica has developed an environmental education program with the students of the European School in honour of Emma, the neotropical otter that was rescued by the Tucan Rescue Ranch. The students researched the issues affecting rivers around their school and community and identified some of the things that they could do that pollute, uh, they do that pollute rivers in their everyday lives. They took action by making lifestyle changes, volunteering to clean and restore a river habitats and communicating their findings and actions through social media. They also learned that rescued neotropical otters and developed, sorry, learned about rescued neotropical otters and developed an enrichment activities for Emma. For Tucan Rescue Ranch, educating through impactful experiences is fundamental to raising awareness about the importance of conserving the wetlands home to otters. The project was directed by Stephanie Valle Cubero, who joins us today, the education coordinator and tropical biologist at the Tucan Res Rescue Ranch. We are joined by two members of the group, Juliana Morales and Elodie Colbert, uh, who are two of 10 individuals involved in the program. So I will pass the floor over to Julie and Elodie, and you should be okay to share your screen and stuff. It says that you need to um, like let us to let us share. share. Okay, two seconds, and I will. Where I I will make you co-host. Which 
It should tell you, and then you should be able to share from there. That work for you? Um, I have to uh, allow my computer to hold up. Yeah, let's go on the rush. Um, do you think, uh, Stephanie, could you, could you share the presentation? Because I'm having trouble with my computer. Yes. Thank you. Perfect, I can see that. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Elodie Colbert and this is uh, Juliana Morales. And we'll be presenting about like river pollution in Costa Rica and our general project with the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Mm -hmm. So first we're going to talk about CAS. What is CAS? Um, it is a crucial part of the IB program and the European school, which is the school we currently go to. Um, what we did for CAS and how we helped and worked with the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Um, why we did it, um, it was mainly to support Toucan, the Toucan Rescue Ranch cause and for us, for the IB and CAS. And then river pollution. So we're going to talk a little bit about like uh, the rivers that we looked at and how their pollution is causing animals to die and to suffer. And then we'll show a roughly seven minute video explaining our process in detail. Okay, uh, you can go to the next slide now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's not continuing. Just one moment, please. Oh, sorry, I guess my internet is a bit slow. There we go. Wait, go back, back, back. Sorry, just like basically. Sorry, sorry. I guess I was hitting the button and Here then. We go. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to start with what is CAS? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically, CAS stands for Creativity, Activity, and Service. It is a part of the IB pro program, which is the International Bachelorette. Um, it is one of the three cores of the IB program. CAS is needed to pass the IB. If one does not pass CAS, one does not pass the IB. A CAS is supposed to be seven hours per week. Um, it, uh, for, so in this case, CAS creativity stands for learning new skills outside the IB curriculum. Activity is doing physical activity and service means helping others. So, for example, an activity that would be just S, like service, could be helping children, uh, teach them, like, help them do how homework, how, how to speak English, or this. And the, or this. This is a great, a great example of CAS. Um, and it would count for uh, service and creativity. So in this case, CAS, uh, the European school has done CAS by helping build a marine turtle egg hatchery in Pacuare here in Costa Rica. That counts for activity and service. As you can see, that's uh, the school building the hatchery on the first picture. And then on the second picture, uh, we have the European school once again hiking through Costa Rica's rainforest. This counts as activity and it helps us with the IB curriculum. Okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. 
how and why we work together um, in CAS and like how we help the Tucan Rescue Ranch and what's its relation to CAS. Next slide. <laughs> So we work together by um, creating, by different types of film that we did. Uh, one was creating enrichment toys for Emma, the otter that, who is a permanent resident at the Tucan Rescue Ranch. And um, we also did a river cleanup. We did research, research about otters in Costa Rica, river pollution. Um, we also got the chance to participate in the World Otter Day webinar. Yeah which we are right now, <laughs> students. We also created an internet post to further expand information about river pollution to make sure that more people are involved when it comes to river pollution and learn what it is, the causes. Um, we work together because, because both institutions believe in positive change, both believe in environmental conscience, consciousness. We believe that otters are really important and that we should work together to protect them in not only Costa Rica, but globally as well. Next slide. So its relation to CAS, it helps us, the IB students, by gaining CAS points in order to pass CAS. Um, it also helps students gain awareness of otters and river pollution in Costa Rica, also globally. Um, students were able to achieve activity, creativity, and service by working together, planning, making sure that everything was done correctly. And CAS brings together students, Tucan Rescue Ranch workers, and otters alike together. All right. Okay, so river pollution in Costa Rica, causes and mitigation. So um, river pollution is a significant environmental issue in Costa Rica, a country known for its rich biodiversity and abundant water sources. And several factors contribute to river pollution in the country, including agricultural activities, industrial discharge, inadequate waste management, and urban development. So two rivers that we're gonna be looking at in the presentation is um, Virilla River, which um, is, was originally a humid tropical rainforest with a high variety of plant species. However, since it's located in the most developed part of the country, um, all the human activity there has drastically decreased the area's biodiversity. And the second river is um, Pirro River or Bermudez River. It has two names. Um, and this river has suffered drastic deforestation and fragmentation, which has largely affected the amount of wildlife found in the area. Research conducted by two universities in the country known as the UNA and the UNED states that the bird species there have dropped significantly and animals like rodents have increased. Next slide. So some key reasons behind this pollution, other than what it has been already mentioned, is that according to um, the, uni like the University of Costa Rica, which was a 2018 study, there are five treatment centers for the sewage waters in Costa Rica, meaning that up to 70% of the sewage water is not properly treated and disposed of, which is why rivers in the Central Valley, such as um, Vivida River, are so immensely um, principal pollutants in the river include heavy metals such as copper, lead, nickel, and mercury. And in the Tempisque River, which is um, close to Guanacaste, had, well, even arsenic has been found there in the water. Okay, next slide. So here are some pictures um, that we obtained of the Pirro River. In the middle picture, you can see a dead rodent, which uh, well, we've, we believe that one of the causes is other than, you know, um, predators, a cause could be the pollution and many clothes are just, well, dead, like disposed clothes are just hanging in the trees and it's awful to see. Next slide. Okay, so what can be done to stop this? Well, raising water treatment awareness around the nation is one of the biggest things that we could be like that we could do and for people to apply new methods and habits in their daily lives is also a great thing um, adequate sewage water treatment no inadequate trash disposal 
not permitting sewage water to reach the rivers without proper treatment, decreasing deforestation, and avoiding harmful soaps, oils, and residue um, materials from factories. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to show you a video of um, what we've done and our process in detail. We, we hope you enjoy it. Yeah. You want me to put the video up, Stephanie? Uh, could you could you show the video, Ben? Let me just stop. Yeah, if you stop sharing, I'll, I can check my video up. Thanks. Thanks, girls, as well, for that. Here's the video. Along with a couple other classmates, we decided to show you some of the activities that we did. Then there is no audio. Okay, perfect. Thank, thank you for letting me know. I will stop that again. It should share screen. Oh, it says share sound. Uh, I will try again. Johnny said there. I decided to the European school. Along with a couple other classmates, we would like to show you some of the activities that we did. Hear that? This is Joshua Tickpin, and I am an IB student from the European school. Along with a couple other classmates, we would like to show you some of the activities that we did. Hello, my name is Mirana Raja, and I took part of the Otter Day Enrichment Toys Project with the Tukin Rescue Ranch. And I decided to do this project and take part of the volunteer group to be able to help the otter out and put in practice my design abilities and creativity. My name is Juliano Morales. I am a student at the European School and I help the Toucan Rescue Ranch with enrichment toys for Emma the Otter. I decided to join this project because I believe that otters are a really important uh, sign of a healthy ecosystem and it's really important to know about them, uh, especially with Emma in this case she was an otter that was rescued by the Toucan Rescue Ranch and unfortunately she cannot live in the wild, so it's really important to have enrichment and help her really fulfill the role she had in the wild, but while being in the Toucan Rescue Ranch. We first met with the Toucan Rescue Ranch team at about the start of February, and we decided to have several meetings to decide who was going to do research, who was going to do enrichment. Personally, I wanted to do enrichment and with another classmate. And we programmed several meetings to decide what materials we should use, what toys we should make in order for that the otter, Emma, those toys were safe for her and were appropriate for enrichment. So the first thing I did with the process was to make some sketches of my ideas. Uh, I ended up with an idea of making a ladder-like structure out of bamboo. The idea of making it out of bamboo is for it to be completely safe for the otter as it is an organic material and it won't blister or break when she uses it. Um, to start the process off, I had to go look for bamboo. Uh, so I cut it up with a machete and added little holes for the otter to look for food in it. To start off the constructing process, I was able to find bamboo and with help I cut it into pieces to make two different columns and also rows to make the structure of a ladder. I also added different holes made with a machete so that the food could be inserted there and the otter could have more, more of a challenge trying to find the food with only the sense of touch and smell. After the structure was done, I was able to visit it to Can Rescue Ranch and actually apply the toy with Emma in her enclosure. We placed the toy in the pool against the pool wall 
before Emma was released. And we also added different types of fish so that Emma could find the food just by smell. Emma was really happy with the toy and she really enjoyed her time trying to find the food. This was really effective and we also, after Emma had time with the toy against the wall, we also put it completely flat in the water so that Emma could swim around it and also find the food in the water. My original idea was to get like a ball made out of wood and have several holes uh, made carved into it so we could place food in them so that Emma had a hard time uh, finding her food. Um, so it was difficult to find the materials, but at the end we decided to make it out of coconut, which floats and serves the purpose we originally wanted it to be. Um, it was pretty entertaining to see Emma try to find the fish food in her little place and it was very nice. So in the end this was a really effective project that really helped Emma enrich her environment. Uh, this is really important because enrichment toys help otters and different animals not have as repetitive and monotone days which is really important if they are in captivity or if they live in a rescue center. For this river cleanup, we worked with Rio Urbano, an organization dedicated to making a change in rivers. This time, we cleaned Rio Maria Aguilar, located near the center of San Jose, the capital of Costa Rica. Now, the river was mostly filled with textiles, such as many clothing items, rags, etc. Also, to some degree, there were some plastics. Once we got to the river, we started working in the shore. We couldn't get into the water because, well, it was really dirty and it was a hazard. So in the shore, we grabbed our plastic bags and with shovels and machetes, we started chopping away into the cloth that was around the rocks and roots and other plastics and putting them into the bags. We couldn't make them too heavy because we had to go, go up a hill and take the plastic bags into a roof. So that's what we did for about an hour or two. And in that time, together with the whole of Rio Urbano and all the people from different universities that came to work for the morning, uh, we managed to clean over one ton of trash in the river. We didn't really realize how dirty the river was until we went down to the shore when we saw all the garbage around and the smell of the water, which was really shocking to us. Uh, and we may think that a ton of garbage is a lot, but in reality, from when we first got to the river and when we left, we didn't really notice much of a difference, which really shows how much garbage there is in the river. Uh, something that shocked us was the houses next to the river, which in the winter many times get flooded and people have to put up with diseases and the smell of the water uh, at some locations. And we were happy to help these people because they really need our help. And while we do think uh, this experience might not be the best or most joyful or happy experience, we do think that it is necessary because it shows how people need our help and how if we are willing, we can help them. So finally, we also did some research about the state of the rivers where we live and we created a post about our research to share it in social media platforms and raise awareness about river pollution. Simple lifestyle changes can make a big difference in improving the river's quality if we all decide to apply them in our everyday lives. Awesome guys, that's a fantastic video and really shows how great work you're doing. First of all, before I go on to the questions and, and talking more, uh, thank you to Julie and Elodie for speaking. Um, it's the first time we've ever had sort of children or younger people involved, so good on you guys. I know if I was at your age, I would be a little bit daunted and probably wouldn't do it, so good on you at, this, at your young age to have the courage and the knowledge and the professionalism to come and do that for us for myself and the rest of the attendees today i think everyone will agree that you did a superb job and it comes with questions and comments too um 
Erica said that was gorgeous. Well done, girls, and the rest of your group as well. I'm sure she will echo my sentiments in saying that. I'm sure Emma was delighted with all your efforts. Andrea said we often learn about plastic pollution in rivers, but it seems here there were a lot of old textiles as well. What are the main reasons or sources of this type of pollution, if anybody knows? So the main reasons are because there are a lot of inhabitants next to the rivers, so they often just throw away these old textiles and they're often just left near the rivers and, you know, they don't do much about taking them out of the rivers. So that's one of the main reasons behind the vast amount of textile pollution in these rivers. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and if I may say a word, I've uh, worked with Rio Urbano before and it's amazing how many times they've actually try to clean them. I think we might have lost Stephanie there. Uh, Stephanie, we just lost you there when you were saying you were back. Yeah, sorry. Um, what I was going to say is that very often it's easier to take away other kinds of trash from the river. And as uh, one of the students explained, they actually had to chop away out of the, the, the plastic. So I've seen furniture there. I've seen everything that you can imagine. People just use a river as if it was a huge garbage can. It's, it's, it's very sad to what extent uh, to what extent they do not value the river. Uh, there is another very important uh, room for environmental education. We have some very low income um, people that live around Maria Aguilar. So that also leads to why there is this kind of uh, pollution there. Yeah, that's interesting. And out of interest, when you did the cleanups, um, if uh, Julie or Elodie want to answer or Stephanie, did the local people that live around kind of get involved or in, in any shape or form? Some people do, but it's a minimum amount of people. Some people have, from seeing Rio Urbano constantly try to uh, clean up, a few uh, local people have joined, but it's a minimum amount of the people that are actually cleaning up the river. Yeah. Um, Wendy Smith and Stella have asked if just if slides will be available. So I'm just going to answer that. If you can send me an email, you should have my email from getting the link to this um, with the information on what slides or if the video, um, if you want them, and then I will ask the speakers um, if, if they're okay with that being sent to you. Um, the will also be available online in the next so a week or so. I'll get this onto YouTube. Um, so you can rewatch it again if you want information that way. If anyone has any questions for either for Stephanie, Elodie, or Julie, or any of the other speakers, um, we can kind of open the floor to anybody. Um, Manuel, uh, you have one. You can maybe just ask it yourself, Manuel. Oh, well. Um, so Manuel's asking, have you studied Emma's behavior to try and identify any abnormal uh, abnormalities in her behavior? Um. Yes, uh, the vets are in constant um, in constant observation. Uh, we, uh, at a certain point, were afraid uh, about some sort of stereotypes, but that is why we try to manage that through a lot of enrichment. Uh, because of how smart Emma is, it's one of the things that we constantly need to be making sure that she has a very enriched environment. So. Uh, Sometimes it feels that no amount of enrichment will get her occupied long enough, but we do everything in our power to make sure that she uh, has all the different kinds of enrichment that is needed for her. Uh, but Manuel, if you ever want to come around and take a look at him, <laughs> more than welcome, that would probably be very, very helpful for us as you are a water expert. Yeah, I hope to visit again Costa Rica soon. And so... Yeah, also I was reading that Emma is from Sarapiki River, right? Correct, Emma was rescued from the Sarapiki River. Uh, it was a case of animal abuse. Some kids were throwing rocks at Emma and her mother. Emma's mother swam away and Emma was left behind. She couldn't swim. She was so young that she couldn't swim. Um, and that is how she ended up here at the Tucker Rescue Ranch. Uh, do you know which um, from which location in Serapiki River, close to Tirimbina, 
or to Pozo Azul or? Uh, I, I believe it was near Puerto Viejo because the story says that the, the women that actually rescued her was in the bridge, from what I understand. It was from the bridge that she saw the kids that were near the, the river. I don't know the exact location. Uh, oh. It happened nine years ago. And my nine husband years ago. Like, wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to imagine the, 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 the bridge. It's the entrance to Puerto Viejo town, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope to visit soon. <laughs> uh, we've got there. Uh, so Rachel Kuhn has said, great, congratulations. I'm sorry I have to say it, even if it's auto related, but I'm happy to see that people from your generation are wearing Friends, Nirvana and Star Wars t-shirts. So I think that's uh, directed at I know uh, to Julian Elodie that you guys are friends fans. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, Nirvana's <laughs> great. What can I say? And friends. Yeah. Just, I, that's my favorite shirt. Actually. And Star Wars is a classic, so. Mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, any, if anyone has any other questions for any of the speakers, um, or if any of the speakers have any questions for each other, then feel free to throw them out. No, it doesn't look like it. Looks like you've answered all the questions necessary. Uh, I'll give them a few more seconds. Okie dokie. Well, that, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the attendees for attending either this session, the previous session, or both sessions, um, and coming along and learning from all these awesome people working on ours and different factors in wetland conservation or marine conservation or the the species that they happen to be working on so first of all thank you so much for you spending your day with basically with me and the other speakers that we've had today secondly i'd like to reiterate what i said to julian elodie great job on what you're doing in costa rica and what you're doing for emma for wetland habitats and again reiterating good job on coming on here and speaking in front thank of you thank you fantastic um, should be very proud of yourselves. And finally, to the the previous, the other four speakers. Obviously, you should still be proud of yourselves. Um, but thank you so much for coming along and sharing all your expertise from Claudio and Lali in in Argentina to Angela in the US and in Alaska, and Faus in Tunisia, and to Manuel who is Costa Rica but based in the US as well. Thank you so much for coming along. I'm pretty sure I'm and confident in saying on behalf of all the attendees, it was great to have you along with us. Great to share the last few hours with you guys. And I'll pass on any comments that they might have for you. And on that note, I will end the webinar. Once again, say thank you to the speakers. Thank you to the attendees. And I hope you have an awesome rest of the world out there. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.